Any other questions on the plate? Uh, about the, the foam, EDA foam, you were saying if we were doing one with soft like that, you, yeah. you talk a little bit about like shaping that. Easy oh yeah, it it's so easy. You sand. can just sand it. <coughs> it sands beautifully. You know, there, I forget what the movie was. They they they, they hit a, a, a cosplayer up to make all the armor for this film. Um, this is a high budget film. I can't even think of it. His armor looked like real armor. I was impressed. Like I'm like, holy cow. The the you know, there's a lot of people that make fun of the foam community. They're like, ah, oh, here's the foam people, and it's like. Foam, 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 but man, you know what? Them guys are threatening. They got some serious skills. But there's but different densities or something? There's different densities. Yeah. You know, foam is hard to get in some places, so you can go and get those foam mats uh, from like uh, Lowe's or something for, they got diamond pattern on one side, yeah. smooth on the other, you can use that. Um, best thing you can do is order it online and get it. But sanding blocks, make yourself some sanding blocks, give you, be anything, different shapes. Like I have dowels, I've got teardrops, I've got wedges that I can put on any type of uh, type of sanding paper on there and sand it. And and it, it you'll know as soon as you start sanding it, it 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 goes pretty well. And uh, the more grit you use, like 80 grit, it'll just rip it apart. Um, I also have uh, what they call uh, electric knives, where they heat up and you can cut right through the stuff. That you have to be a little bit more careful about, especially young kids. You know, you, you get hurt with that. Um, yeah, All right. Uh, Any other questions on the blade? Hey, Brian. Nope. Okay. okay. So, got that. Um, the next thing we do is um, what they call a suka, and it basically in, in Japan. Um, the Japanese swords, they'll, they'll use different types of wood and um, the, they have two halves and they literally take a chisel and they carve out, you know, they'll, they'll lay the blade down the tang and they'll draw the outline and then they meticulously carve out each half to create this shape. And it's, oh, it's, it's square blocks and they'll put that on there and they clamp it and then they'll, they'll shape it. They'll cut it with planers and you know, shape it with planers and stuff. And then they sand it and they get it to the shape they want. And then they cut this notch out here, which I'll show you what it's for later, uh, to create this shape right here. Now, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to cat it up and print it. <laughs> now, what you can do, you can use balsa wood, which is very easy, balsa wood. You know, cut that like butter, and it doesn't matter because once it's together and it's glued, or you can use pine, pine's another one, this is going to get wrapped with leather, so it's going to be even more stronger, and then it's going to get wrapped with a braid, which makes it even more stronger. But um, this is uh, what we call nylon, I think I'm going to use nylon 12 or nylon 11 to print this material, and it's not readily available to anybody. You have to have a very expensive printer, but, um, uh, but if you do have a MakerBot, you can do this with ABS. If you do have, uh, um, if you don't have a MakerBot, again, blocks of um, uh, wood. Lay your blade down. The blocks don't even have to line up. All you want to do is lay the blade down, draw that shape out, go half the thickness of your blade, chisel that all out with your, your uh, knives or whatever you're going to use, and do both sides. And the blocks could be like this, it doesn't matter. As long as the inside is together, and then you could turn around and cut your shape, both sides, the curve to get correct, and and just sand away until you get your shape that you want with that. Uh, any questions on this? Do you want it? Do you want it to be a tight fit? Uh, that way, like you want a little bit of loose fit. But you keep it for their swords. They would pin it, and when they needed to do maintenance, they would unpin that, and this whole thing would slide off. And um, I'll show you how that goes. But um, they uh, they had uh, a piece here that would slide off first, called the habaki. 
uh, and then you would have the, your suba uh, that would slide on, that's a guard, and then uh, suka, which would slide on next, and then you'd have, you would have what they, an end cap pommel or kashira, and then braid it, and then that end knot stops it all, then sometimes they'll put what they call manuke in there, and then they would pin it, and that, that pin, that single pin, kept everything locked. Some of these guards, it, they would just, you know, flop around. They weren't very tight, and, you know, as they got used. But that's how it goes. If you're going to make it permanent, which I would, because there's no reason why you would be wanting this removal, make it as tight as you can. And I always leave enough space for epoxy, because if you make it too tight, you put the epoxy in there, and you squeeze it, you're, you're squeezing out all your, your epoxy. And that's one thing a lot of people do. So. Now this fit here is it's, it's spot on, it's very tight. Now if I push this, it'll go on, I don't want to do that. But um, before I permanently mount this, I go over this edge with a file. I'll put this in a vise and I draw a file to give me a few thousands, six to seven thousands, all the way around clearance. That will give me enough for the epoxy to actually have a good bond. And again, this is stuff that you can this, what I'm telling you is what you can use with your foam and your plastic. Um, I want you to take away how this goes together and you can apply this to um, that. Uh, whatever media you're using, foam or wood. Again, you can even make the blades out of wood. Another good one is uh, what I was telling him is um, the uh, bamboo sheeting, uh, which you know, use in flooring a lot. Get the flooring material, really long planks, and cut it out. Man, you already got, you know, uh, something that you, you know, the thickness and everything right there. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is the um, the habaki. And what the habaki is is um, it's a piece here that uh, it's a detail piece that goes over uh, through the sang and over the blade first. And what they would do, how they made it, is they would take uh, certain kinds of metal, which would be brass, uh, copper, and it would be the sheets, and they would peen it out. They would just shape it, shape it, shape it, and um, until they got the shape, they want little files and everything uh, for all the details and um, uh, to create this. Now what I did was I catted it, and I machined it uh, to get this shape. Now, for them, when they're done, it would be permanently around, it would, it would be uh, a hole in the center, so it would slide on. I made it two <coughs> halves, but traditionally, this would be one piece. They would literally form around a buck or something uh, to create this. And then they would have the little saws, and they would cut this and cut that, but it would start out as a flat sheet of metal. It's, it's amazing. So they would paint it over, and then they would solder, uh, joint solder. They, they use different techniques for doing that, uh, to create that joint. But you can too. The copper, shape it. You know, you have your blade like this. Shape the copper around there, and at the bottom edge, solder it. Now you've got the shape around your blade. And then if you go to the profile, you can hack away with a little file, a little saw, to give you this here. You can use that to do it yourself with copper. Copper is the best because you can solder it, oh, you can God. shape it easily, form it, you can etch it with the uh, um, etching solution from Radio Shack. And all you got to do, put the electrical tape on here, cut your patterns, and chemically etch it. And uh, you're good to go. Paint, any paint really on it. Uh, you asked, someone asked me before about painting. Okay. Uh, EVA foam, there's there's actually special paints that you can use for EVA foam. Do a Google search. Uh, the cosplayers already got that nailed. There's a couple books out that are magnificent on cosplay. Um, uh, Vulpin uh, Props, V-O-L-P-I-N Props. That guy created a book that you have to have in your library. It'll teach you weathering, painting, masking, using stencils, creating the stencils, 
Um, it's like three or four bucks uh, download ebook. Fulton Trot, B O L T I N Trot. Guy put every trick for cosplayers in a book for painting and weathering. And I believe he's also got one out uh, for crate foam uh, weapons and things like that. There's another woman, she's in Austria or Germany. Just look for the woman that speaks with a German accent. Her books, magnificent. Every type of armor that you can do, anything you can do with EVA foam, that's the way to go. And uh, I'll give you my email address. If you guys need the specifics on the books, I'll email you the links and stuff um, to that stuff. Uh, and any other questions you have. Um, so that's the Habaki. Uh, best thing to use, like I said, copper. Uh, it'd be the easiest if you can get copper in any art, any art, the RC hobby shop. All right, so the next thing, um, the Suba. And uh, how this is done is they would take a piece of metal and they cut, again, they would have their little drills, not electric, but they had little hand drills. They put holes in the shape, then they go in there with their little files and little saws, and they would, or chisels, they use the chisels a lot too, little chisels, and they would create their shapes and stuff, and they would cut this opening up that would fit the tang, the back end of the blade. That would slide on like that. And um, how I did this, I used aircraft loom 6061 um, and uh, uh, actually 7075 is what I used for it and machined it out. Um, I anodized the entire thing red. The blood red for Deadpool was a combination of multiple dips of different shades of red and um, black. Uh, to get that, that dark red. Once the whole thing was anodized, I masked off what I wanted to remain red with Super 33 or Super 88 electrical tape. It's awesome because the thing about um, uh, that electrical tape, mainly the 88, if you got a little Harbor Freight bead blaster, sand blaster, um, or an industrial one, I use personally 80 grit glass and I run it at 40 PSI. 40 to 60 PSI. 40 PSI is great because I can control so I don't go too far and screw something up. But the great thing about the electrical tape is it's not affected by the glass media. If you need to get a close edge, it's not going to tear up the electrical tape. So you can get really close to the electrical tape, even go over the electrical tape, and it's still there. And then when you're done, I handle the part with gloves. Everything that's be blasted. Um, is going to get Cerakote gun coating. I use Cerakote gun coats. I use KG gun coatings. Uh, I used to use Duracoat, uh, but they're they're not as durable. No pun intended, guys. <laughs> 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 they're not as durable. Duh, I know it's stupid. As um, some of the other coatings I use, or even anodizing or hard hard coating. But, um, once the black is done, I go in, remove that electrical tape that took a beating. And then I'm left with this beautiful piece here, which, if you look close at the edge, I got the bead blast very close. I still maintain a very nice, crisp edge. And I'll pass this around, or you can come up here and we'll, you guys can look at it. Um, so, what you can do, best thing to do for something like this, Plastic, man, you can get ABS, styrene, RC stores. You can get different thicknesses. If you don't have this thickness, stack them. Use the glue, a special glue for styrene, special glue for ABS, stack them, cut your shape out. In fact, how you can get this edge, this here, that's um, got a step down, the center, say you do this in three pieces, the center part is the most square, where the red is, and then do these little black pieces, two black pieces, sandwich them together, and now you've got your three-dimensional part. And paint them separately. You can paint them separately, then mask that area off. Wherever the glue's going, you want to show, glue it, put it together, then take the mask off, and then you're left with, with a part like that. Um, using plastic, also wood, wood. 
Yeah, yeah, I know it works because when I was doing playhouse, yeah, local right playhouse and theater, uh, we didn't have budgets so and <laughs> we didn't have anything really. So whatever we could get, we used. So the next thing we have is called a kashira or a pommel. And um, again, they used, uh, they would take copper and brass and shape and paint it. Get a piece of wood with a shape on it for the inside, and then they would just paint this around until they got the shape that they wanted, and um, sand and, and hone it with stones. They have this little slot that goes through both sides. And what that's for is when you put your sword all together, this slot here makes up with the. Uh, with that. So when you're wrapping your braid, when you're forming your knots, the braid will go through that slot and you cinch it down on the other side and you finish your knot on the other side. And now, not only does it hold your braid in place, it can also, it's cat and your, uh, the end is complete. And they would just chisel this out of the wood to form that little knot. Again, anybody wants any of this information, I'll send you whatever you want if you email me, and then you can have it uh, and uh, play with it. So you'll send us measurements of the swords? I'm not going to send you a cat, <laughs> just uh, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for one of those to ask me that. Um, I will give you every reference material I have that I use to create these swords. And um, it, it, and it's it's pretty good information. I have my own little folder. I'll gladly send you everything I've got. Cool, man. Um, this piece here, I would use balsa wood or pine or something like that. And you you guys may have better wood that you you, you like better. And the best way to do this, if you have no wood routers, you just have hand tools, is just carve it out. Make a pattern out of. Uh, uh, styrene, styrene holds up and you can keep using it. If you make it out of paper, it's kind of a one-shot deal because it's going to get all messed up. But you just want to make sure that you get that, that shape that you want. It's going to match the uh, and you want to make sure that it's oversized, meaning because you're going to wrap this with leather and then you're going to braid it, and you want the braid to be at the same level as the outer diameter of this shape. Because if you make this the same size as this, once you wrap this with leather and braid it, you're gonna. this is going to be thicker and this is going to be thinner. Um, Alright, so what I did for Ryan's um, sword was uh, finding the type of material was a pain because um, um, it's really hard. Uh, when the Japanese used real um, stingray skin, it's hard. It's 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 like uh, rawhide, for a dog rawhide. And how they would do it is they would soak it for like a week, and then they would wrap it around the, the handle. They, you know, like dog rawhide. It's like it. Well, <laughs> it's stingray, but it's the skin is like hard. It's a real raw. It's like rawhide. Yeah. It's dried out and it's hard. Um, so you have to soak it until it's pliable and, and it's like soft and leather. You would wrap your 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 zuko or your handle, and then um, you would wait until it dried out, and that could take another week. And, and then it's hard again. Now, but now you have the shape. But the only way what they would cut to make a nice seam, they would cut the top edge or the bottom edge to get their seam and butt it together, and then it would get glued to. Um, handle. Uh, that could take too long, especially if I got two weeks and I got to produce all this. It's not happening. Um, I have to find other means. But, and the only way you could cut that stingray at home, besides with a hacksaw, which is pain, the easiest way is a Dremel and a saw and cut that. That's how tough this stuff is. And, um, uh, and then you, you, you would, uh, you could stain it or paint it 
but uh, but that's uh, that's that race and I, I don't have the time. So uh, I have to go other means. So I find simulated stingray. Now they have stingray that's soft and pliable and stuff, and nobody could find the pattern they wanted. No, it's too dark. No, it's too shiny. Oh, it's got gold in it. Oh, I don't want that. No, that looks good. I don't like it. Yeah. Literally, that's how this goes down. So plenty of samples. I've got two complete cows of useless material because I couldn't buy a small sample. Instead, they don't do small samples, especially when you're going to high-end dealers with this stuff. You have to buy a quarter, a half, or a whole hide. So I've got two hides that I'll never probably use it sitting at, at, at the shop. So nobody liked any of the patterns because uh, the scales, some of them looked like snake scales, some of them were too pebbly, had large pebbles, small pebbles. It didn't look right, nobody could agree on anything. So what I did was, I found a, a high-end upholstery shop in New York City, I told them what I wanted, and what they did, ultimately it was this one here, I'm not going to tell you which one it is, but, uh, <laughs> but the pattern looked pretty good, and everybody, and again, I'll have this out so you guys can look at it, um, everybody liked it, but, but, the only way they would give it to me is with this uh, gold, hideous uh, reflective gold. Now it doesn't look that bad here, but look at a big sheet of it. Um, and so I sent a couple samples up to the studio and they didn't, yeah, they didn't care for it, didn't care for it. But, so I decided uh, to contact them again. They said, listen, we can make you the pattern and we can, do this, but you got to have this coloring. So they made a custom pattern just for me, but it had to have this coloring for whatever reason. So I got stuck buying an entire cow again um, to get something that I only needed a small section. And uh, so I ended up ultimately using this and um, this this particular pattern that they made for me, specific to um, Ryan Swords, but it had this color on it. And after I wrapped uh, the handles with it, I then took some uh, Neat's foot oil and uh, 3M Scotch Brite and rubbed until the coloring started coming off. But what's great is the oil, which is used for leather work, uh, it, it moistened the leather and it, and it looked good. And it, it made the leather very you know, had a nice feel to it. So I moisturized the leather, it, it, it kind of absorbed the oil, and it got rid of the coloring without destroying, without having to sand. If I use regular sandpaper, it worked. But now I've, I've literally killed the leather with, with sandpaper. So Scotch-Brite and Neat's Foot Oil, and you can remove coloring, dye off of, uh, top dye off of your leather. So that's what I use for what they call a Samic. S-A-M-E, uh, to wrap Zuka. And what did I use to wrap this? Contact cement. Same thing you can use, nothing special. Contact cement, you put it on your part that you're going to, adhere to, and on your leather. You wait until it, uh, it, it you give it like 15 minutes, and meticulously being careful, you start wrapping the handle, and I do little sections at a time, stretch it, wrap it, because once, once it grabs, it, it, it grabs. And if you start removing it, you can, it, it just, it. So, uh, contact cement. Last, oh, this is how big, it, this is how much material it takes to wrap one handle. And, uh, Okay. Yeah, I got a, I got enough to make a lot of swords, but but hopefully I'll get a. Hey, they, made a of, they made a lot of money for that for that movie. They might, yeah. they might need that count. Well, hopefully I'll I'll get on the next uh, couple films with the the Deadpool franchise, and I got enough material. But, uh, so that's what it takes. Um, now here's an art, so you that you, or a little tech tip you need to learn. 
you're brave. Um, which they call a suko ito. Um, this here is quarter inch suede leather. It feels really beautiful. It's a really nice feel to it. That 15 feet it takes to do a typical Japanese sword. I wanted to make sure it was the best. I ordered this from a, a sword maker in Japan. This here is about 130 bucks for 15 feet. Um, I think I could have went to Joanne's. <laughs> and I could have had more money in my pocket, it. but he that's probably not. ordered it from America. I got, from Joanne Fabric. I got it from Japan. There's reason for that. I won't go too much into it, but um, um, I love Japanese swords. I wanted to make an attempt at, at uh, making these swords uh, as nice as I could put it. It's really hot for but. but the point I want to make is quarter inch width. You have to make sure that whatever thickness you're using will determine how long this is. Because Quarter inch mathematics, quarter inch, quarter inch, quarter inch, quarter inch, as you're making and forming your diamonds, I'm going to show you how to do that quickly. Um, if you don't have this proper length to this width, you could end up like this. And it, it doesn't look right. Because when you're forming your knots, it ends up being like this, and then it, it's hard. So, um, uh, there's plenty of information out there on the net, I won't bore you with it, but they're uh, a way of uh, getting the proper uh, uh, length of this. It typically takes 15 feet of this to do one sort. About 11 and a half inches, quarter inch, 15 feet. You'll end up with some excess, but again, 11 and a half inches, 15 feet. And that's the formula for a quarter inch. All right, so uh, another thing I want to point out real quick, if you guys are into Japanese swords, uh, a friend of mine, what? Did you figure out how much time it takes to thread the uh, Oh yeah, it takes, took me, uh, once I got good at it, it takes about 20, 25 minutes to wrap one handle. Uh, Walter Sorrells, or Sorrells, has a set of DVDs that goes through every meticulous point of sword making. It doesn't matter what kind of sword, but it's Japanese swords, but Walter Sorrells or Sorrells. Um, you need, uh, his last name is spelled S-O-R-R-E-L-L-S. Um, buy the DVD set. He, he's a great guy um, and um, is an author and stuff, but this here is everything you need to apply to swords Literally any time. Other things that I think you really need, this is the Bible for the kings. First time I'm showing anybody what I use to create the kings. This year will give you every kind of chemicals that you can use, household chemicals, chemicals you can order, the formulas, how to apply it, on what materials, and what effects you'll get. It's, it's literally idiot proof. I mean, this is, and, and listen, listen, I'm not a chemist by any means, and I don't retain information like people may think. I go to this all the time, and it makes it so easy. So there you go. It's, uh, it's not that, wasn't that much money, but uh, yeah. Another book which I really like is um, Japanese Patinas. And again, you want to put down here, you can always come up and get it. Um, this is another good one. It uh, goes over um, some of the arts and what they did back then uh, to get certain patinas. And they don't have the access to the chemicals and the methods and stuff that we have today. All right, so that comes any quick questions on what we covered? What? Ten minutes. Yeah. I got a question on just the industry. You said that they spent a lot of time rejecting some skills. Why do they care for something that most people don't notice? And it's not really them, it's me. Well, but so it's me. The answer is think outside the box, stay in front of change, and when they see one of my swords compared to what they're used to, 
I leave that wow in their mind. I leave my name on their mind. And when the